Hi, I'm Nafisa Salatic and this is Across the Balkans. Today on the show, I look at the challenges Bosnia and Herzegovina is facing from both inside and out. Although it doesn't share a border with Russia, Bosnia has been thrust into spotlight since Russia began its attack on Ukraine. And the latest comments from Russia's ambassador to Bosnia has made the situation more tense. Igor Kalbukov warned if Bosnia decides to join NATO, Moscow will react the same way it reacted to Ukraine. The chairperson and Bosniak member of the Bosnia's presidency, Shefik Jaferovic, called Kalabukov's statement an attack on the territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina, adding that Russia has no right to chart the future of Bosnia's security. Jeste li protiv toga da Bosna i Hercegovina bude članica NATO-a? Mi smo, znate, Bosna i Hercegovina... Jeste jednom zaprijetili ukoliko... Čekajte, čekajte, samo malo. Mi smo za ono šta Bosna i Hercegovina odluči. Ako ona jednom odlučiti da bude članica bilo šta, čega, to je unutrašnja stvar. Ali drugi razlog i druga stvar je naša reakcija. Na primjeru Ukrajine mi smo pokazali šta mi očekujemo. Ako bude prijetnja, mi ćemo reagirati. The United States was the first to condemn ambassador's comments, reiterating their continued support for Bosnia. The U.S. Embassy in Sarajevo tweeted, the Russian ambassador's latest threats to Bosnia are dangerous, irresponsible and unacceptable. No third party has a say in security arrangements between NATO and sovereign countries. We will continue to stand firmly by Bosnia as it takes the necessary steps to secure its place in the Euro-Atlantic community of nations. In the same week as Bosnia was rattled by threatening comments from Russia's envoy, another political crisis unfolded. The latest round of negotiations over changes to Bosnia and Herzegovina's election law ended without an agreement. The talks, held over four days, took place in Sarajevo with the mediation of an EU delegation. Five of the six parties participating in the negotiations accepted solutions proposed by the international community except Bosniak leader Bakir Izetbegovic as the A party. Following the talks, the leader of the biggest Croatian party in Bosnia, Dragan Čović, said there are absolutely no conditions for holding general elections in October as previously planned. EU mediator Angelina Eihorst blamed the Bosniak and Croat parties for failing to reach an agreement on the election model and described it as a missed opportunity for Bosnia's journey towards European Union membership. My guest today is Marko Attila Hoare, who is a Balkan historian and associate professor at Sarajevo School of Science and Technology. He is in London for us. Marko, good to have you with us on the show again. Thank you very much. Do you see the failure to reach an agreement on the election law as a missed opportunity for Bosnia, as the EU mediator described it there? And will the elections uh, take place at the end in October? Well, I don't think it was a missed opportunity. The trouble is, is that the European Union and the, and the United States are um, pursuing a model of so-called electoral reform that actually threatens to further entrench sectarian divisions in the country. So essentially, this is an effort to appease the Croat nationalist position, which is as represented by the uh, Croatian Democratic Union in Bosnia and Herzegovina and by the government in Zagreb, which is to try and ensure that this party, this Croat nationalist party, HDZ, would have its own guaranteed man in the, in the, the Bosnian presidency. Um, and that would be not good for Bosnia's integration, to have its party that's essentially opposed to Bosnian in integration uh, having its automatic seat in the Bosnian presidency. So it's actually rather rather good that this, this attempt was defeated and resisted. You tweeted just recently that election reform uh, is an attempt to tighten Bosnia's chains and that Bosnia's neighbors, Croatia and Serbia, are predators that want to take the freedom of sovereignty away from the Bosnian people. What actions by Zagreb and Belgrade made you think that way? Well, this pursuit of electoral form is one example. The trouble is, is that um, ever since the regime of Franjo Tuđman in Croatia in the 1990s, uh, Croat nationalists have tended to view Bosnia Herzegovina not as a sovereign country in its own right, but its own right to be to be sovereign, but rather as kind of a, a sort of imperial backyard, a bit like Russia views uh, Ukraine, for example, and the, the belief that 
Croatian interest lies in, in keeping Bosnia uh, weak and, and um, preventing its integration as a state. Uh, so this attempt to try and ensure that this party, the Croat Nationalist Party, has its automatic seat in the presidency would make it harder for Bosnia to work to work as a state. If you have, if you th imagine having three three presidency members, two of which are in the hands of essentially nationalist anti-Bosnian parties, um, then that would make it very difficult for Bosnia to, to, to function as, as a state. So what do you think needs to be done for the election reform to be fair for all? You need to overhaul the Dayton system. The trouble is this Dayton system was introduced in 1995 essentially by an international community that was committed to um, appeasing uh, the aggressors, prim primarily uh, Serbia. Um, it essentially in, entrenched the results of the genocide and, and aggression, above all through the establishment of its entity, Republika Srpska, um, but also through these mechanisms that give um, the Croat nationalists dis disproportionate share of power in, in the federation. So what you really need is to try and replace the Dayton system with a wholly new system that kind of establishes a more civic model, uh, which would allow the democratic majority in Bosnia to govern to function. Um, one other thing, there is no consensus on joining NATO in Bosnia either. As we know, Bosnian Serb leader Milorad Dodik is strongly against that uh, since the beginning, and especially in the wake of the Ukraine crisis, his stance seems very firm. Um, and in, meanwhile, Russian ambassador to Bosnia says if Bosnia joins NATO, Moscow will react. It's, this created quite a stir in international media too. How serious is this warning for the future of Bosnia and its relations with the alliance? Well, I think it's in principle serious. We have had this, this problem that um, Russia has established Dodik's regime in Republika Srpska as its client state. And Russia works by exploiting divisions in the Balkans, keeping conflicts unresolved. So it opposes recognition of Kosovo, it supports destabilization of Montenegro, it opposed the resolution of the Macedonian name dispute. Uh, and one of the things it does equally is pr promoting this separatist regime in Republika Srpska. Um, and that's a card that Russia always has, has in principle to play. That at some point they could open another front by uh, bringing about Republika Srpska's secession. However, uh, the fact that Russia has done badly in the Ukrainian war so far uh, makes that option less attractive. So if Russia had won easily in Ukraine, you could easily have seen Republika Srpska declaring independence, opening up a new front. But now I think, given the Russian failure and isolation, that the leadership in Republika, Republika Srpska might be inclined to be a bit more cautious. So do you think that uh, in some way the Ukraine crisis and what the European Union and the Brussels saw during Ukraine crisis can have a positive impact of the future of the Balkans, not just Bosnia, but the Balkans in general, and speed up the EU and NATO membership processes for the countries that eagerly are waiting for it? Well, it should in principle. The lesson that should have been learned is that Russia is essentially a malevolent force attempting to overturn the liberal democratic uh, order, rights-based order in the former Soviet Union and in the Balkans. And given it's the, the chaos it's caused with its invasion of Ukraine, that the opportunity should be taken to deal with these threats it also poses in the Balkans, including, and perhaps above all, uh, the threat of Republika Srpska. So there should be an opportunity to try and bring about some radical change in the Balkans, including the establishment of a, a functional Bosnian state through the replacement of a Dayton system. However, unfortunately, we have not really seen that happen so far. So uh, the US and EU have gone in the opposite direction, which is almost to try and appease the local troublemakers further in Bosnia Herzegovina, for example, through this electoral reform. So unfortunately, I don't think the lessons have been learned. Marco Attila Hoare, thanks so much for being our guest. Uh, he is a Balkan historian and associate professor at Sarajevo School of Science and Technology. Thank you again, Marco. Thank you very much. Thank you. The conflict in Ukraine has not only exposed Europe's security challenges, it has also revealed its economic vulnerability. And countries across the Balkans seem to be the worst hit when it comes to rising food and fuel costs. Montenegro, which is reeling from rising prices, has proposed a new financial package to tackle the economic crisis stemming from Russia's attack on Ukraine. The proposed set of measures include a 40% cut on the fuel tax, which the government is hoping will prevent rising food and transportation costs. Meanwhile, in Albania, protests against price hikes continue despite Prime Minister Edi Rama promises to help the most in need. Now let's take a closer look at the rising fuel prices that are hitting several countries in the Balkans. 
Since December, fuel prices in Montenegro have seen a rise of approximately 47 cents per liter, hitting 1.7 euros. In March, fuel prices reached a new high in Albania. A liter of gas increased to almost 2 euros, a 30 percent jump in a week. Fuel prices in Croatia have increased by about 33 cents since November 2021, jumping to 1.72 euro per liter. Predrag Dretsun is in Podgorica for us to discuss the economic impact the Ukraine crisis has on the Balkans. Predrag, good to have you with us. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, we have seen fuel prices surge across the region, but the situation is more complicated in Montenegro as the country is facing political crisis as well. So what can be done to prevent the prices getting out of control? Yeah, you are right. Uh, we, we would say in Montenegro that one problem never comes alone. So, so we have several problems, some interior, some exterior. Definitely a uh, problem between Russia and Ukraine uh, is uh, spreading all over the world. So it's uh, not possible for Montenegro to be avoided. So, but the problem of Montenegro is because we have uh, no government at this moment. Uh, actually, we have government, but in some technical, let's say, technical mandate. So it's not a good position for making decision uh, in this at this moment. Uh, what is the worst uh, than this is uh, there is no let's say there is no vision that the new government will be consist. So uh, because Democratic Party of Socialists, the former ruling party, uh, delivered this morning some new conditions to. Uh, mandator Mr. Dritan Abazovic, who is a young man, very, I would say, ambitious man, and someone who will try to, to, to make uh, a new Montenegro, but I'm, I'm not sure that his mission will be successful. So at this problem, we have, at this moment, we have two problems. Uh, Montenegro is a very divided country, as you know. Uh, historically, uh, half of Montenegro, uh, let's say, prefers Serbia and Russia, uh, another half prefer uh, let's say Western countries and Western philosophy. So this is very rough said, but this is in essence. You, I hope that you understand what I'm what I'm talking right, about. Right, I do, I do, but do I do want to go back to to prices? Uh, are we likely to see that the crisis in Ukraine further strain economies in the Balkans in general and in Montenegro and take an even greater toll in the coming months? And what sector will suffer the most? Yeah, uh, our tourism, definitely. So tourism, transport, and because in foreign investors as well, because the foreign investment are in Montenegro so much important because uh, we have a, a foreign trade deficit and we need we need foreign investors. And the last period, uh, the, let's say in the first uh, previous decade, it was Russians, mm, later Ukraines. Today, we depend a lot of Turkish investment. So if we missed, let's say, Turkish, uh, Russian and Ukraine gets at this uh, in the next touristic season, we will be in problem regards to tourism and our uh, income from tourism. How many tourists so, from Russia um, usually visit Montenegro every year? And we know that Montenegro joined EU sanctions imposed on Russia. It was one of the first countries to join the sanctions. So what kind of impact will this have on the fact that so many Russians usually come to Montenegro for their holidays? Could you imagine that we have some, let's say, some some uh, classes in our uh, elementary schools in Budva, especially in some other cities, consist of Russian children. So uh, it's a lot of uh, Russian people here last 20 years, especially after uh, independence of Montenegro. So I would say that every year we have something between 100 to 200,000 guests from Russia to come to Montenegro. So in, in Ukraine, so this number is not so huge. But uh, it, uh, the, the number of Ukrainians will, will be increased if it's not happened, what's happened. So uh, we, we will be in trouble. It does mean that Montenegro must orient, uh, be orientated to Bosnia and Herzegovina, to Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia. And this will be our market for the next uh, maybe one, maybe two seasons. So who knows? Because everything is unpredictable, as you know. Predrag, what can Western Balkans economies learn from the current crisis? Most of the countries depend on exports, as we know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, in general, I, I was a witness of previous sanctions again, uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. I was a member of the Montenegro government at this moment, and I know that sanctions are not good weapons. So because it it affected it affects just uh, just the 
people, the usual people, average people, not not leaders. Uh, so uh, in this moment, Montenegro has a huge problem uh, to overcome to overcome uh, problem with the food, because we are not food producer. Our agriculture is a symbolic in Montenegro. Uh, it's not important about uh, fuel. We can survive without fuel, but without food, not. And Serbia is our main foreign trade partner regards food. So it will be the the, 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 the biggest challenge in front of Montenegro several next months to, to overcome and to, to establish the, the, the not independence from the food. But at this moment, it looks like very hard and the new government will be in a huge problem. Predrag Dretsun, thank you so much in Podgorica for us uh, discussing the economic impact the crisis has on Montenegro and the Balkans. Thank you again. Thank you very much. North Macedonia is currently suffering from a surge in food and electricity prices. In January, the country saw a 10% increase in electricity and a 25% hike for cooking oil. The more prices increase, the more people are leaving the country in search of a better life. And as a result, North Macedonia is now struggling to maintain a skilled workforce. Becky Mlaci reports from Skopje. Saladin Zulfiu is packing. He is leaving his home to go to Germany in search for a better life, just like thousands of other North Macedonians who have already left the country. The queue in front of the German embassy in Skopje is long. The dream of life in the West is depopulating the country, while frustration from unemployment and low wages and the ever-increasing price of food and electricity is growing every day. Saladin is one of many skilled workers who left North Macedonia for Germany. He says that after completing the paperwork, his wife and daughter will join him since he is planning to stay there for good. Dozen buses depart each week that for final destination have cities in Western Europe, mainly in Germany. What worries most is the fact that people who travel on those buses are mainly skilled workers who on the other side leave deficit of workforce back at home. The construction sector is mostly suffering. И се случува на ситуации каде што мора да се вратат луѓето по два-три пати да го коригираат тоа што предходно го згрешиле за да дојде до она фаза на која што треба да биде. Така да ние воглавно го имаме проблемот со квалитетот на луѓето, но со бројот на, на работници немаме некој значителен проблем. Ние сме приморани да им дадеме поголеми примања за да можеме да ги задржиме а воедно и трпиме и штета на временски интервал. I went to meet Fatmir Bitucci, the deputy prime minister in charge of economic affairs. I wanted to hear from him, is there any strategy to keep the qualified workforce from leaving the country? for duke mos pas kompromis ra permisimi ta standard te jetesis ve siguris te jetesis por migrimen duet ta shohim si fenomen global te aspirata se nierve pe te pas nitarme matmir ne vedona hapet siguris diskutime de debate shum spet 
që edhe ne do duhet të jemi të hapër për të tjerë të cilët do kenë nevoj dhe do duhen që të bin në Maqedonin e Veriut për të punu. Realisht, iniciativet e ndryshme rajonale të cilët kemi ndërmar, po japin e fejtet e para, ku ne kemi në fakt pruje të fuqis punëtore prej vendeve tjera në Maqedonin e Veriut, sepse për nianc, në sektor të ndryshëm, pagat janë më të mira sepse në, në vendet tjera të rajonit. At the end of 2021, North Macedonia was hit by a surge in prices of food and other services, culminating in a 10% increase in electricity prices in January, which is expected to push prices up even more. The data of the state statistical office shows that there is a serious increase in the price of basic food products, cooking oil by 25%, brand and sugar by more than 9%, fruit and meat by roughly 6% higher. Teško život. Skupote je mnogo. Plati slavi. Ne može da se žive kako što treba da se plaće. Lošo. Mnogo lošo. I bez to živeme so 10.000 penzija. To ti je. Pa mnogo je kako da ne mogu. Kako da ne mogu to. To i ovaj, ovaj ne znajme više kako da izlezeme na krajeve, gospodine. Ne znajme kako stvarno, ne znajme so pari, ne znajme kako i da, da kako ke priživejeme. A ne ova pusu 2016-a, pa Befja, ki prašal. Ovo so pokačuvanje, to da ne govorime, uopšte nemam, nemam zboru, nemam tema, da ti kažem. Kriza ekonomike filom dikon me palačitene pandemis, COVID-19, dhe masat të cilet filuam ti mar, ti ndërmar qeveria preja se ko, për të më paritja në konsumit, bëri që të paracitet një falloj inflacioni në, në, në shuqërin tonë. Dhe kjo në, në, në mënyr aktive aktivizoj inflacioni dhe filloj të rritet shmimet. Mirë po, kjo nuk është vetëm një, një pjesë e saj. Pjesët tjera janë se uh, ekonomia jo bazohet, është e orientuara nga importi i energjis elektrike dhe derivateve të naftës. Kështu që ne prodhema fër 25% të rrimës elektrike në shtetin tonë dhe pjesën tjeta duhet ta importojnë. To maintain peace at home, North Macedonia's government increased the minimum wage from 270 to 320 US dollars and in addition froze the prices of basic food products such as eggs and milk. As of today, prices are defrosted, but there is a wholesale margin trade for these products limited to 5% and the retail trade by 10%. This measure has frustrated farmers. Now that everything has become more expensive, they say freezing the price of things like eggs and milk means they can no longer make money. Qumshti nuk ka hipër të na. Ashtë qmimin që shakon, 20 dinar. Detelina pi 10 dinar dhe bon 17 dinar. Kalamo që pi 10 dinar dhe 17 dinar. Edhe na nuk mujmë të mamu me këto qmime. For such a than he did. Tanin Chetranon, Cheveria, Hawking Tolls, Nayef, Dretin and Mer. Danokin Shanai Nolz Domui, part of it, Mes Vonkas Kashkoin, Nai Nolz Dipik Dipper Chin, a Dut Menai Kriato, Nietore, Nukanaka Kriche Diviet Hitch. The government, for its part, is monitoring the situation to prevent an artificial price hike. Një gjë që nuk do e lejon, edhe që jemi duke përcijel shumë, është momenti eventual i marveshjes mes prodhuzve dhe trektarve të produkteve të ndryshme që në mënyrë të organizume të ketë rritje të qmime. Kjo në ekonomi një si marveshje mes katelve, që është kunder regullave të konkurru e shmëris dhe dënohët në mënyrë shumë të rrët. The struggle to find a job with a decent wage to provide for the family is emptying the country. Institutions in North Macedonia don't have concrete data on the exact number of people migrating to Western countries. But one thing is certain, a brain drain is leaving the country with less workers, less skills and a reduced ability to face the challenges of the future. Bekim Lachi, TRT World, Skopje, North Macedonia.
Many countries in southeastern Europe are facing uncertain times as economic and security threats continue to grow. We'll continue to cover how those challenges will be addressed. Thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans. See you next time from me and the team. Bye-bye for now.